Hello, esteemed power plants class. This is, uh, what is this, Wednesday afternoon about almost four o'clock. Uh, I'm going to record a brief introduction to the uh, power test code for uh, steam generator efficiency determination. I will send you this document. Uh, normally, I give a big take home problem on this but we are just running short on time. So I'm going to spare you that agony. Uh, I think it's a pretty valuable exercise, but it is extremely time consuming. And I just don't feel like I've had enough time to, uh, to give you the background that you need. And um, I think the week that we lost due to the extended spring break has pretty much cut this out as far as a formal requirement. But I did want to, I hope you watch this. Uh, it won't be, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. Uh, and add this document to your library, uh, especially if you ever uh, are involved in anything related to the power industry, you might find this valuable. Okay, so this is power test code, and this is 4.1. Uh, and this is an older version. This is an outdated version of the performance test code for boilers. But I have a copy someplace of the new one, but it's in excess of 300 pages. And it's just too cumbersome. It's too large. I can't really scan it in and email it. The document is just unwieldy. Um, and so this one is, I don't know, 70, 75 pages. Uh, a lot of tables, there's tables and stuff in here. So this one is at least manageable. And it serves the purpose to let you see kind of what's involved in formal uh, boiler efficiency testing. Uh, this document can be used as a framework for legal actions. For example, if uh, you bought a big boiler from somebody, B&W or General, Motor, General Electric, not General Motors, or whatever, um, then, and you didn't think it operated uh, up to specifications, this document provides a formal test procedure by which you could test that unit. And if it did not come up to the required specifications, you could actually file suit based on an analysis. And this is the document that kind of lays out the groundwork for doing the official testing. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty good to know that this type of information is out there. So I think, well, that's just the cover page and we got acceptances and a forward, you know, there's some discussion here. I'm not gonna read all that to you. Uh, that was written back in 1964. I think this version, this is an updated version from 72, but it's still been out there a long time. Uh, personnel on the uh, PTC committee, uh, you can look through all those if you want to. Um, so here's a, a short list um, without all of the affiliations. Uh, here is an uh, index table of contents, what's in this thing, introduction, objective and scope, and then it goes into uh, uh, equations, uh, very detailed prescription as to how a uh, boiler should be efficiency tested, okay? I'm gonna read just a couple of these sections to you. Uh, just a couple of excerpts, not the whole thing, but uh, section zero introduction. Uh, this code contains instructions for testing steam generating units, i.e. boilers. These units are defined as combinations of apparatus for liberating and recovering heat together with apparatus for transferring to a working fluid the heat thus made available. Uh, for the purpose of this code, such a unit may include boiler, furnace, superheater, reheater, economizer, air heater, and fuel burning equipment. Well, this sounds like right kind of down our alley in this course, and it is. The economizer and air heater are not considered a part of the unit when the heat absorbed by them is not returned to the unit. So there's, you know, I mean, there's a lot of legal distinctions in here. Uh, it is not the intent of those testing procedures to obtain data for establishing design criteria of individual parts of the overall steam generator. And there are other code supplements, uh, 4.2, 4.3, testing pulverizers, air heaters, respectively. 
Okay, so the rest of this I don't think is of great interest. And I'm just going to read uh, the first section or two here. Uh, the purpose of this code is to establish procedures for conducting performance tests to determine efficiency and capacity. So let's say, you know, you bought this $300 million boiler and, you know, your engineers didn't think it was operating as well as didn't have the efficiency, the capacity or both. And you're anticipating uh, trying to go back to the manufacturer and the contractor and to do something about it. And so, but how do you do a test? You know, if you do your own test by your own procedures and it ever gets into a court of law or legal proceeding, uh, they're gonna challenge that and say, well, that's not the right way to do this. Well, this is the document that lays out the appropriate way to do a test so that everyone should be able to be on the same page. Um, other related operating characteristics such as steam temperature and control range, exit gas temperature, draft loss, steam, water, air, pressure drops, uh, solids and steam, and air leakage. <clears throat> so those are other characteristics. <coughs> okay, and so I'm gonna just skip down here a little bit. Let's see, okay. Uh, efficiency for two methods is expressed by the following equation. So we actually have two methods of efficiency determination. One is what's called the input-output method, and efficiency is, you know, output divided by input, you know, common sense definition that you all know. And output is described as heat absorbed by working fluid or fluids. And then the input is the heat in the fuel, the chemical energy in the fuel plus heat credits, and credits are other energy types that enter the control volume of the boiler. And we'll see, for example, heat uh, energy that comes in in the combustion air. Well, before the air preheater, that has energy. Uh, it's that there's sensible energy in the coal fuel that comes in, and that's not necessarily defined as energy in the, as heat in the fuel, as we'll see. Uh, and then the second way is the loss method, and that is 100% minus heat losses. And there's, I think there's, I don't know, 15, 16, 17 different losses possible. Not that a boiler will have all of them, but a big boiler might have, you know, eight or 10 of them. Uh, and that's the, the, the magnitude of that loss divided by uh, the heat in the fuel plus the credits, in other words, the input, and then times 100 to get it into a percent. And so, this document gives equations uh, for evaluating the efficiency for both of these techniques. Okay. Okay, let's roll on here. And so this is the diagram. And I'm going to start by making this thing smaller uh, or bigger or smaller, and then I may make it bigger. But it's, uh, it's a little hard to, to get the entire scope, but then it's hard to read when it's this small. But anyway, so the, the, the heavy dotted line is the uh, control volume for the boiler, okay? And so uh, everything that flows into across or out across the control volume, anything that's released within the control volume, all that is certainly within the analysis. Now, uh, so you see we've got a stack up here and we've got our fuel and burners down here, and we've got all kinds of different uh, items that can cross the uh, boundary of the control volume. Now, we'll back up so we can take a look at some of these in more detail. Um, so let's see, let's come down here, and good old number one is coal, okay? So coal crosses the boundary into the analysis, and it goes into, uh, unit system pulverizer or crusher, including fan. Well, so that's inside the control volume. So we have coal crossing. Uh, we have uh, some electrical energy potentially going into uh, this. You know, this could be motor driven pulverizers, etc. Okay. Uh, there could be fans in here, including fan. Okay, so it takes electrical energy to run those motors, that crosses the control volume, that has to be quantified. Um, here it's possible, five is a dash line. Oh, I forget, what does the legend mean? Is it gonna tell me? 
Uh, I don't remember. We'll have to see. Maybe we can probably figure it out. Okay. Um, I, I think this is a vapor or gaseous state. Eh, not steam though, because the steam is not dotted. But gas is dotted, uh, tempering air. Anyway, this is tempering air from uh, room or the FD fan discharge. If we're putting that in say to the pulverizer or into this fan. Uh, potentially we can have rejects. So this can be rocks or things that come in with the coal that are kicked out of the pulverizer and they exit the system. And it's not very many, but they bring energy in and after going through the pulverizer, they may come out at a higher temperature and they may take energy with them. And so that has to be accommodated, okay? Uh, if we're say burning oil, um, we can have an oil heater. Now notice the oil heater is actually outside of the control volume. I believe this is a flow measurement point, is this three, and then this goes into a burner. Likewise, the coal out of the pulverizer and any airflow with it goes into a burner. Uh, and we also show secondary air coming into the burner. Okay, we'll trace out the airline from on top here in a minute. Um, we have uh, steam is potentially used to atomize the oil. And so if there is any steam used for atomization, uh, it would be measured here at 42, and that would be included in the calculations. Uh, we could be on natural gas as a startup fuel, or I mean, it could be natural gas. This could be a natural gas boiler. This could be an oil boiler. You know, it doesn't have to be pulverized coal. Every boiler doesn't have to have all of these. These are just the possibilities that are covered in this performance test code. So we have our burners in here. Uh, we, if we have a force draft, uh, our force circulation, not draft, force circulation boiler, this would be the circulating pump that's providing the circulation around the water loop. And so it's inside and we have electricity going to that and so that electricity has to be quantified. Uh, a lot of times there is some cooling water associated with the walls of the boiler, certain locations to make sure that things don't overheat. And so this just for protective purposes. And so we could have a water flow that's coming in here at 40 at one temperature, coming out at 41, picking up some heat. And then we are measuring that flow at 41 also. So that's, that's a flow meter. Um, we can have uh, water injection and water leak off. So we could have some additional water coming in here. I'm not sure off the top of my head what the purpose of that would be. It's not cooling. Um, at any rate, it's possible to have that. Uh, we may have uh, dry refuse, you know, clinkers and things falling down to the bottom of the boiler that are being taken out, mass flow. Uh, there's a certain amount of energy that leaves with them. Uh, sometimes we circulate ash pit water down here, have some water down here to make sure we don't start a fire down in the bottom of the boiler when this stuff is really hot, falls down here. Sometimes it can burn a little bit. So we circulate ash pit water through there. <clears throat> okay, let's come up here and let's look at uh, our fans. Okay, a little bit. And so here is our FD, our force draft fan. And so it's coming in and we may well have a tempering coil. One of the videos talks about this because we don't want to get the flue gases too cold in the air heater to condense moisture and cause acids. So if it's really, really cold outside, sometimes we have to actually heat this cold air before we get it into the air heater. The air heater is heat recovery, but we can't condense moisture any, high, any water vapor in here, if it gets too cold, it'll condense and form acids. So that's what the air tempering coil is. And we may well be doing some flue gas recirculation. This can be done for temperature control or NOx control. And so if I have a recirculation fan, it would pull a little bit of uh, this uh, air and recirculate it back up here. I'm sorry, that's not the flue gas recirculation. I misspoke there for a second. Uh, 
this is a this is a pretty complicated uh, diagram here. Uh, okay, so uh, but recirculation is I could pull some of this hot air up. That's right, and put it back in up here, and maybe be able to do my preheating with recircul recirculated air if I don't need all of it in the boiler instead of putting heat, which may be in the form of steam or something in this thing. I'll get it right here in a second. Okay, uh, air heater, uh, a lot of times this thing rotates and requires some, may require, probably does require electrical energy to rotate the air heater, that would be in. Okay, uh, so here's our, uh, uh, the air discharge from the FD fan uh, goes through the tempering coil, goes through the air heater, and then comes down. And so it would supply secondary air and it would supply primary air. So that would be primary secondary air supply. This would be the wind box. And then this is into the pulverizer to transport the pulverized coal uh, to the burners. Okay, got that part finally. Uh, let's see. Well, we got feed water. Let's take a look at it. So we're going to measure the feed water flow here. Uh, it's coming in and it enters the economizer, which is the final stage of feed water heating. So it's in at 24, looks like it's out at 27, and enters the steam drum. Um, <clears throat> other things uh, associated with the steam drum, uh, we may take uh, some uh, steam for soot blowing out of the drum or for other auxiliary uses. So we could have a tap coming out of the steam drum. This would be saturated steam in the drum. Uh, we have blowdown coming out of the, the drum. Uh, and we, of course, we're going to come down and feed the uh, steam generation circuits out of the bottom of the boiler if it's uh, forced or pump circulation. We go around this loop. It's going to come up through here. This is where the steam is uh, generated. And then we'll come back up into the, 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 the boiler here or into the drum for uh, separation. Okay. And then the saturated steam would come out at 31. Uh, go through superheaters. This would be on a temperator for spray. Would go through the second. Uh, let's see, we go to the, what, uh, we go to the uh, primary superheater first, get my names right, I get confused, primary superheater, and then to the secondary superheater, and then out to the boiler. Uh, you need to check those, make sure. Uh, did we go primary? Yeah, I think this is primary and secondary. You need to check that on some of the diagrams. But at any rate, these are these are superheaters with a temperator in between. We're measuring the water spray that might be might go in, and then 32 is leaving the boiler, going out to the turbines. Okay, should have reviewed this a little more. Okay, uh, so here is our reheat steam. So that steam goes out over here, goes through the high pressure turbine comes out of the high pressure turbine, comes back over here for reheating. Uh, we have an attemperator here where we can spray into the cold reheat line. We go through the reheat su superheater and then back out to the IP and LP turbines. I uh, got a note here, 36, all other air entering the unit. I'm not sure off the top of my head what that is. Um, but I think that pretty well. Okay, now we can look at the flue gas flow. Okay, so out of the furnace, let's do that. So here's my flue gas exiting at uh, 12, coming into the economizer at 13, probably pretty close to the same state, but you know, who knows? I mean, so these distances, you know, this is definitely not the scale. Uh, then it dumps off uh, heat to the feed water coming in, in the economizer, comes out. Uh, okay, so here's my flue gas recirculation fan. I got this one confused with this one a minute ago. So if we're doing flue gas recirculation, we can do this for at least two reasons off the top of my head. We can do it for some steam temperature control. We can also do it to limit NOx emissions. If you pull some of this off, put it back in here, it gives that no any NOx in here a chance to be destroyed by going back into the furnace. 
and also uh, this gas coming in uh, by adjusting the flow out of this, you can have an impact on your uh, steam temperature. So that's two reasons for that, okay. Uh, so then we come on up here and we go into the uh, air heater. And then uh, out of the air heater, so it's gonna get cooled down. And then we're not showing a lot of gas cleanup equipment like uh, NOx and SOx and all that. We're just showing a dust collector and an ID fan. So here's my FD fan blowing in. Here's my ID fan sucking out. And uh, this is a preferred location, even though some of the Kingston units actually have the ID fan out here before the dust collector and it gets eaten up by the, uh, all the uh, particular, all the ash particles in, in the flue gas. But anyway, the balance between these fans sets the uh, pressurization of the furnace relative to atmosphere. So if you have the ID fan and the FD fan, you're probably slightly negative inside the, the furnace area. Um, and then if we had any sort of an additional waste heat or low level economizer, we might be, some people could recover some heat from here. But these days with all of the gas cleanup, that's probably not possible. And then we go up to static. Okay, so look over that. Okay, so here's, and I'm gonna make this smaller and then we'll come back. But this kind of shows, uh, the overall inputs, uh, these are the flows that come in and, and go out, and these are the losses. And then this is, shows kind of a determination of the efficiency equations, okay? So, and then let's take these uh, in a little bit of detail here. So the heat in the fuel, that's defined as the chemical heat. So when we combust the fuel, that's the heat that gets released. Uh, from the combustion. But we have other energy, other heat that enters uh, the control volume here. So we have, and, and again, if you dig into these documents in the later chapters, you can find equations and definitions. So it's very well defined. It just takes a little bit of effort to go through and read all of this. And uh, like I said, I just don't feel like we have enough time left in the semester to hit you with a big problem for this. So I guess you boys and girls are gonna skate out on this a little bit. But anyway, you'll have the document. Uh, so BA is heat and sensible heat in the entering air. BZ and B is just as the, the symbol they use for credit, I don't know why. B sub Z, heat in atomizing steam, if you're doing that. Now you may not. Uh, B, I think that's F, uh, is sensible heat in the fuel. So, you know, this coal that comes in has some temperature, and so there's sensible heat, sensible energy in the coal as it enters uh, the envelope of the boiler, or the, the, as the control volume, I guess I should say. Okay, B sub X, pulverizer or crusher power, okay? Uh, B sub script X, <laughs> whatever we got, looks like the same thing here, but anyway, it's not quite. Uh, boiler circulating pump power, so that's for the, if we have a forced circulation uh, of the water around the steam generation loop through the tubes and the drum and the downcomer and all that sort of thing, that would be the power that goes into that pump. Primary fan, uh, primary air fan power, if we have it, recirculating gas fan power, heat supplied by moisture in the entering air. So, you know, we're bringing in outside air, it has moisture in it, and that moisture has energy, it's vapor, it's water vapor, it's coming in, so it's bringing energy into the control volume. And then any uh, heat in the cooling water that's supplied, so it may be cooling parts of the envelope or whatever, whatever cooling water we might have. Okay, now these show, I believe these are all of the flows. And so we see feed water coming in and heat in desuperheating water and circulating water pump injection. 
So if we're adding any water, desuperheating would be a temperator sprays. And I guess if we're uh, in the circulating water, if we're injecting any water into that, um, I guess that could be in the drum per se. We could have some additional water injection up there in addition to the feed water. Uh, you could put, I guess, your makeup water separately from your feed water into the drum. It's possible. Uh, okay, so then we have uh, heat in the reheat steam coming back from the boiler in. Any a temperator spray in here, heat and reheat steam out. And then we've got uh, heat in blowdown and circulating pump leak off water. So that would be additional water that could get out of the system. And heat in steam for miscellaneous uses if we're pulling out any steam for some other purpose in the station, okay? And then we have losses. Oh my goodness, look at all of the potential losses. Mm -hmm. And I probably can't even define all of these to you. I can take a pretty good shot at it. Uh, so, LUC, well, unburned carbon in the ash, refuse or ash. So if, you know, we, we have a certain amount of uh, uh, heating value to the fuel, but if we don't burn all of that carbon, say, typically it's, you know, it's unburned carbon, then we don't release all of that energy and that's a loss to the boiler. So we've got uh, heat in dry gas. So that would be the dry flue gas leaving the boiler and it definitely leaves the envelope with some temperature and that's a loss. Uh, moisture in the fuel. So moisture comes in and then in the burning process gets vaporized. So it comes in in the liquid state or in one state, a lower energy state, leaves in a higher energy state. That's a quantifiable loss. Uh, let's see, moisture from, in the fuel, moisture from burning uh, hydrogen. So then that hydro, as you know, that hydrogen can burn to water vapor, it's gonna go out, we're gonna make sure we quantify the energy that goes out with it. Uh, moisture in the air, uh, I think I talked about that one, moisture in the fuel. Um, heat in atomizing steam, you know, that's certainly a loss. Uh, carbon, Monoxide, if we have CO in the flue gases, it did not burn, have complete combustion to CO2. So any CO that goes off out the stack is a, a loss. Um, unburned hard hydrogen, I think that's probably unlikely, but it's possible to have uh, unburned hydrogen in the stack or unburned hydrocarbons. Radiation and convection losses from the outside shell of the boiler. That's, those will definitely be present. Um, radiation to ash pit, sensible heat and slag, and latent heat of fusion of slag. So that solid material typically are radiation losses to the ash pit uh, that can be quantified. Sensible heat in the ash or the flue dust, that's a loss. Heat and pulverizer rejects, we talked about those, that can be quantified. Heat and cooling water and then soot blowing if we take some of that auxiliary steam and blow soot. Okay, so potentially, what is this? I think it's 15, is that right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 12, 13, 14, yeah, 15 potential losses. Okay, so, Output is equal to input minus losses. You can do a little bit of algebra here. And so, you know, that you wind up with uh, an equation, one minus the losses divided by the uh, chemical energy plus the sum of the credits uh, times 100 is your boiler efficiency, or you can just do it uh, uh, output minus input, or input minus losses divided by input. So you got two different equations there that can be used. Okay, uh, they've got forms and such. Uh, I guess I've never really used them, but you could print those, take them out in the field with you, help you summarize calculation forms, that sort of thing. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm not going to drag this out too much. Let's see. Let's go down here. I think it's this chapter seven where we usually hang out when you get the, if you got the problem, you would uh, computations. Uh, so this is where you start. Uh, there's a section for doing efficiency by the uh, input output method. And you get all these wonderful equations. All of these subscripts are defined. The number locations are on the diagram. Uh, guess we should look at the abbreviations. Uh, where are those? Here we go. Here's all of the abbreviations that are used in the equations. A, A prime, A, F. Uh, little a is ash content, and it gives the units. And so it's, like I said, it's a very detailed uh, C, capital C, little b, pounds of carbon per pound of uh, as fired fuel. So that would come from the uh, ultimate analysis on the fuel. CO, percent carbon monoxide per volume of dry flue gas, determined by flue gas analysis. So you would measure that with your analyzer. It's a specific heat, specific heat, constant pressure, you know, just everything, everything in all of these equations. And there's quite a few equations is all defined. Uh, okay, so, oh, you guys are missing so much fun. I hate it for you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, actually, it's not. You know, I, I have a problem that I've used in the past where I, I, I think I, get, I think there's like five, five maybe six losses, and the rest of them drop out due to things not being present. But but if you work that problem, you have to go back through all of these equations and figure out what all of these terms are and plug numbers in for them. Uh, for example, this uh, WSE31. Well, I mean, W, I think, is a mass flow, pounds of steam per hour uh, of steam, steam entering a uh, superheater. Okay, so WSE33 is just the reheat steam flow. So, you know, in the problem, I'd give you, say, the reheat steam flow is this. And so you have a number to put in there. And, you know, these are enthalpies and uh, different quantities. So, anyway. Um, I'll let you flip through here. Uh, let, well, let's go down to the credit. Uh, well, they, these are credits. So the, these are equations for calculating all of the different credits. And then we'll get into the losses. These are still credits. Okay, here by the loss method. Okay, and that's just the general equations. And then, so you start out here. So, you know, L is the total loss in steam generated, which is the sum of all of the individual losses. And then you get into the first one. So, you know, L um, sub unburned carbon. And so you, you know, here's how you calculate it. The w, I think, is a mass flow rate, P prime, D prime. And then there's a definition. And WP prime, D prime is pounds of total refuge per pound of dry as fired fuel. So how much ash, how much dry refuge are we getting out of this thing? And then et cetera. So you go from there. But I'll, uh, I'm not gonna drag this out any further, but it's, uh, it's pretty good. It's uh, very detailed and it's very complete. And it's actually somewhat satisfying once you uh, bludgeon your way through it that, uh, it, it, I think I think it does enhance your uh, understanding overall of the steam generation unit. But you know, this is kind of where the rubber meets the road. This is the diagram that kind of shows you, you know, what the components are, where they are located to your control volume, and then these are your credits, your losses, and your flows, and all of the equations just kind of flow naturally from this. Okay, I'd say that's enough or your final lecture of steam power plants. Okay, uh, I'll be uh, sending you an email and uh, with some information on the final.